today we want to invite you to do as we do each week to reach out to somebody and let them know that they're loved and uh, and and get a chance to uh, continue to to build community even from our own homes we know that uh, that just watching uh, a church service or worship time is not the point the point for us is to not only lift our hearts to Christ but also to live in community with one another and that has been hard this year so let's be deliberate about our desire to build that community with one another. And that sometimes is all we can do is make a phone call, send a message, reach out in the ways that we can safely until the time that we return. So take a minute, pause the video, reach out to somebody and let them know they are loved. Oh, the joy to be, joy to know it's when I decrease. You fill up my soul, what a joy to see, joy to hold, it's when you increase, I want nothing more. my heart all that I have is yours color my prayers widen my eyes wash me in glorious light oh the joy to be joy to know it's when I 
you fill up my soul. What a joy to see, joy to hold. It's when you increase. I want nothing more. Hasten my ears, bridle my tongue. Focus my heart to hear. Settle my pace, purge me of pride. Again and again, you provide all the joy to be, joy to know. It's when I decrease, you fill up my soul. What a joy to see, joy to hold, it's when you increase, I want nothing more. Joy to be, joy to know it's when I decrease. You fill up my soul, what a joy to see, joy to hope it's when you increase. I want nothing more. I brought some things to show you guys, so I need some help. So I brought this bag of things, and I want to show you some stuff in it, and I need you to help me with it. So today we're going to talk about things that protect us. Okay, so protection. What does that mean? Does anybody know what that means to protect? Anybody? Jack's putting up his dukes. So what, what do you think it means? Like, how about maybe to keep us safe, yeah. right? So something that protects us is something that keeps us safe. So I've got a couple things I want you to help me um, de determine how they keep us safe. So here's the first one. Everybody knows what these are nowadays. A mask. A mask, right? How do these keep us safe? Um, okay, so the idea is they keep us from breathing in germs from other people, right? And so they keep us from getting sick. And so we wear these in public, hopefully not for too much longer, but they keep us safe, right? Okay, next one. We've got another one for you. Here's another one. This kind of, this kind of goes along with the last one. Hand sanitizer. How does hand sanitizer keep us safe? protect us anybody else keeps your hands clean okay and it kills germs so if you get germs on your hands that might make you sick you put this on there and it kills those germs and you don't get sick so keeps protects us from germs okay i got another one bam sunglasses Sunglasses. How how does sunglasses protect us? Uh, from the sun in your eye. Yeah, they protect the sun in your eyes. Did you know that they not only, like, it's more comfortable because it's darker and I can't, you know, it's not so bright outside, but they actually protect us from the harmful UV rays that are in the sun. One time when I went to the eye doctor, what the doctor told me was, I better make sure when I'm out running, especially, that I wear sunglasses because otherwise all that time in the sun damages your eyes over the, over the course of your lifetime. Sunglasses actually protect us, plus they look cool. So, um, you know, that goes, that goes with it, right? 
All right, I got another one. How about this one? Flashlight. 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 Whoa! Oh. <laughs> Doom did not know what to do with that. <laughs> a really bright flashlight. What? How would a flashlight protect us? It helps us see. In the dark. Okay, helps us see. What did you say, Logan? It helps us see things when it's dark out. Right. So when it's dark out and we can't see anything, what might happen to us? Oh, uh, you could get lost. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we right. could get lost. We might trip over something that's on the ground. We might walk into a wall. We might do all sorts of stuff if we can't see. And so a flashlight helps protect us from hurting ourselves in the darkness. Okay, I've got one more. One more thing. You know what this is? A no. A lighter. It's a lighter. Can you see that fire? Blue. What it how would it, how would something like a lighter protect us? Um it's to like candles and stuff. Okay, so how does that help us, Hato? Um, was anybody really cold this last week when it was crazy cold outside? I was. And if I didn't have my heater in my house, you know what we would do? We'd build a fire in the fireplace and we'd light it with something like this. In fact, this is what I have it for. And we would light that up with our lighter and, and it would keep us warm. So a lighter keeps us warm by helping us start a fire if it's cold outside, right? So that could yeah. really be helpful. It also protects us by, uh, you know, from the dark, like a flashlight, if we run out of power and we need a candle to kind of give us light, it'll help us with that. So a lighter can come in really handy. Now I brought all these things because today we're gonna learn about Nahum, who is a prophet that talked about God protecting his people. We're back at Nineveh. Nahum's actually kind of a sequel to Jonah, the story of the guy that got swallowed by a fish. And, and Nahum is telling the people of Nineveh, like 150 years later, that God is going to judge them, that bad things are happening because God is protecting his people from the, the people of Nineveh. And it made me think about protection because we have all sorts of things that help protect us you know, uh, uh, that uh, we were talking about. But ultimately, who protects us the most? God. God does. He is the one who has control of our life and our death. And he is the one that cares the most about our well-being. And so he is really our protector. And we're going to learn about how he protected his people from the book of Nahum today. All right, guys. That's all we've got. It was great to see everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. See ya. Don't have it. Yes. Don't have it. So today our scripture reading comes from Exodus chapters 34 verses 4 through 7. So Moses chiseled out two tablets of stone like the first ones. Early in the morning, he climbed at Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him. And he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses calling out, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Jonah. Remember Jonah, you know that story. The bad prophet who didn't want to go to Nineveh when God told him to. So he ran the other way, jumped on a ship, and God brought a storm, so they 
threw him out of the, the ship and into the water to die, only to be swallowed up by a fish and kept there for three days. When he finally tells God, okay, I'll go, and the fish vomits him up on the land, and he goes to Nineveh, and really without any conviction, walks through part of the city saying, you guys are toast. God is going to judge you, and it's all going to be over. And then, surprisingly, the people of Nineveh repented. They took seriously the message that Jonah brought, no matter how half-hearted it was, and repented of their sin and changed their ways. Well, that all happened, we think, around 760 B.C. And Jonah brought that message, Nineveh changed and God did not destroy. Today we're going to look at the sequel. Did you know there was a sequel to Jonah? As we continue through the minor prophets, as we continue through this uh, minor league series, uh, we have a chance to learn from the, the, the word of God as it came from the people that he chose to bring it. Many of them are bringing the word to his people, Israel and Judah. But some of them, like today, their message is not for Israel or for Judah. Their message is for those around them. And in this case, Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire and the people there. So today we're in the book of Nahum. And uh, as, we, as we continue through these minor prophets, what's challenging about this, and the reason maybe you don't preach through it or read through these a lot, is because um, we, we don't have the same kind of uh, uplifting experience we have when we read the Gospels or the Epistles of the New Testament. They don't, we have to understand how they're framed as a part of the Gospel story because they don't always give us that great, I'm leaving church and I feel good kind of message. But they're important. And they give us a glimpse into the character of God and his love for his people. So today, the sequel to Jonah, Nahum. Now, remember, in 760-ish, Jonah came, they repented, and God forgave them. And Jonah was mad about that and whined about it on the side. Well, now we're talking almost 150 years later, and what we find out is the Ninevites are not that different than the Israelites in that their repentance didn't last forever. Yes, they changed their ways. Yes, they repented and God forgave, but it wasn't long before they were back to their old ways of violence and bloodshed and destruction and evil. So here we find Nahum called to bring a message to them, a message of judgment to Nineveh. So Nahum, we don't know a lot about him. We know he's from some place called Elkosh, and we don't really know much about that either. He was around the same time as some other prophets like Jeremiah and Zephaniah and Habakkuk, and we'll talk about, we'll go through those here in the future as well. During this time, Assyria, which is Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria, they had overtaken Israel, had, had uh, invaded and, and taken them over, and had tried to do the same to Judah, but God had actually protected them from, from uh, Assyria coming and defeating them. And so here Nahum brings God's judgment to them. Now, let, let's talk about the structure for just a minute. This is a short book, um, and we're going to read the whole thing together today. But here's the structure. God shows his character in his message as, as Nahum is speaking to Nineveh saying, here's who God is and what he's going to do to you because of what you've done. So we look to clues in a book like this. We look to clues of God's character, not necessarily to, to say God's going to do to us what God did to Nineveh. That's, that's something we call narrative fallacy. When we think, okay, well, God caused water to come out of the rock when Moses hit it with a, with a rod, and therefore, if I'm thirsty, I can ask God to bring water from a rock, and God will do it. And if it doesn't happen, then God must not be real or faithful. It's called narrative fallacy. That's not how we read the Bible. But what we do is we go back and we say, what does this say about God? And how does that inform who we are in Christ, who we are as, as children of God? So we're going to do that today as we look through the structure of Nahum as we look for what God is saying to the people of Nineveh through his prophet. Three themes in three chapters. First, God is jealous. 
Second, God is judge. And third, God is just. And each chapter gives us a glimpse into those character traits of God, helps us to understand what God is doing and why. Not just for his people in that time and at that day, but for us as well. So let's get into it. God is jealous, the first theme in chapter 1 of Nahum as he speaks to Nineveh. So let's read that together. A prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and passed, pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. In chapter 1, we see that God is jealous for his people. Nineveh is judged because they are not gods and they have chosen others instead. And they've chosen a different way, a way that is not consistent with the faithfulness and the covenant that God has made with Israel and Judah, the, the, the desire he has for his creation, even the nations. They've chosen a different way. Now, when we talk about jealousy, we typically think of that as a sin. Warren Wiersbe says it this way, Jealousy is a sin if it means being envious of what others have and wanting to possess it. But it's a virtue if it means cherishing what we have and wanting to protect it. A faithful husband and wife are jealous over one another and do everything they can to keep their relationship exclusive. Remember, God uses marriage as an image of his love for his people throughout the scriptures. God is the groom and his creation, his people are the bride, and there is a covenant relationship of faithfulness between us. And so God is jealous for his bride to protect and to care for those that he loves in his creation. So God is a jealous God. And when he says that, it doesn't mean he's a mean God or he's an angry God necessarily, though those sometimes come up as a part of his loving jealousy for his, his bride as he tries to take care of the one with whom he has committed to. So God is jealous. And that matters to us too, because we as followers of Jesus are the bride of Christ too. And his desire is to protect and hold us close to himself, just as he did with his chosen people in the Old Testament. And so that means when Nineveh comes against that, there is vengeance that God will bring. And again, vengeance that not God's people are bringing, but God himself will bring. The second part in chapter 2, we learn that God is judge. God used the Medes and the Babylonians to attack Nineveh 
and destroy them, to take them over as a way to judge their evil and the things that he is unhappy with them for. Let's look at Nahum 2. An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress, watch the road, brace yourselves, marshal all your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Though destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines, the shields of the soldiers are red, the warriors are clad in scarlet, the metal on the chariots flashes on the day they are made, and the spears of juniper are brandished. The chariots storm through the streets, rushing back and forth through the squares. They look like flaming torches. They dart about like lightning. Nineveh summons her picked troops, yet they stumble on their way. They dash to the city wall. The protective shield is put in place. The river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses. It is decreed that Nineveh be exiled and carried away. Her female slaves moan like doves and beat on their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool whose water is draining away. Stop, stop, they cry, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. The supply is endless, the wealth from all its treasures. She is pillaged, plundered, stripped. Hearts melt, knees give way, bodies tremble, every face grows pale. Where now is the lion's den, the place where they fed their young, where the lion and lioness went and the cubs with nothing to fear? The lion killed enough for his cubs and strangled the prey for his mate, filling his lairs with the kill and his dens with the prey. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth. The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. Just as God used Assyria and Babylon to judge his own people at different times in their history, when they were unfaithful, now he's bringing judgment on Assyria through others. Babylon, who again, eventually is going to come to Israel and Judah as well. And Babylon, as it said, is going to take them away into exile, just like they tended to do to those that they conquered. We're reminded that God is judge. God is the one with power over life and death and is our standard for right and for wrong. He is our standard for right and for wrong. Today, we could do well to remember that what is righteous and what is good is not what we determine either personally or culturally. What is right is determined by the one who has created it, the one who is our judge and our standard for, for righteousness. God is that. And so when we fall away from that, he is the one who chooses the consequences. Knowing that, how amazing that he loves anyway. You know, there's many religions who, who imagine a God who judges, who is the one with the gavel that decides what is good and what is bad, what, who is in and who is out. But our God doesn't just judge, but loves. So in the midst of being the one who determines what is right and brings forth the consequences of those actions, he also is a God who loves fully and judges out of that love for his creation. God is judge. It's good for us to remember that. Now, this doesn't mean, again, narrative fallacy would say, hey, we better be careful. If we start acting like Nineveh, God might swoop in and destroy us as a country, as a city, as a people. Again, we, we don't look at what God has done in scripture and say, well, he's going to do that to us if the circumstances are similar. It's not how it works. But what we do see is God as judge matters today also. So we pay attention to the one who is right and who sets the standard for our lives. Finally, chapter three, God is just. God is just. He's jealous for his people. He's judge over all, and he is just. He cares about what is right, and he's doing something about it. And ultimately, he's bringing what is just to the world he created. We've heard the prophets talk about the day of the Lord where ultimate justice is brought to the world that God has created. Justice matters to God. Jesus, when he came and he went to the temple and he began his ministry, he opened up Isaiah and what he read was, I've come for the, the oppressed and the poor. I've come to bring justice. He didn't just come and say, 
as he announced his ministry, hey, I've come so that you can invite me into your heart and have eternity with me in heaven. He said, I've come to bring justice to the world. God cares about that. Revelation is about that. The new heaven and the new earth is about a place where justice reigns. And what is right is what is happening. So out of that, we read Nahum 3. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots, charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute, alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? Are you better than Thebes' situation on the Nile with water around her? The river was her defense and waters her wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Put and Libya were among her allies. Yet she was taken captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at every street corner. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put in chains. You too will become drunk. You will go into hiding and refuse and seek refuge from the enemy. All your fortresses are like fig trees with their first ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the eater. Look at your troops. They're all weaklings. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has consumed the bars of your gates. Draw water for the siege, strengthen your defenses, work the clay, tread the mortar, repair the brickwork. There the fire will consume you. The sword will cut you down. They will devour you like a swarm of locusts. Multiply like grasshoppers, multiply like locusts. You've increased the number of your merchants till they are more numerous than the stars in the sky. But like locusts, they strip the land and then fly away. Your guards are like locusts, your officials like swarms of locusts that settle in the walls on a cold day, but when the sun appears, they fly away and no one knows where. King of Assyria, your shepherds slumber, your nobles lie down to rest, your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. Nothing can heal you, your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall, for who has not felt your endless cruelty? God is a God of justice. Though he is patient, and he was patient with Nineveh 150 years before this when Jonah brought them the message, eventually he's going to bring justice for his people. In Nineveh, they had done so much to anger God. Their ruthless bloodshed, the violence and the killing that they brought. Their idolatry, the, the gods that they worshipped, which, which led to just sinful and unrighteous behavior. Their pride, they conquered without mercy. They believed nobody could defeat them. They, they broke treaties. They would come in and say, okay, this is what we're going to do and we're not going to hurt you. And then they would hurt them and, and, and kill them anyway. And so God brought his justice to them. So what do we learn about God? We learn that God is still jealous for his bride. His love for us matters to him. And he will go to great lengths to preserve his people. In so far as to send his own son in the midst of our own unfaithfulness. So that we might be restored. He is jealous for us. He wants to bring us back in to him. He's also still judge. He still cares about our actions. And we have to pay attention to what is righteous according to God who sets that standard. We are called to be righteous. And though we can't live up to it completely, it still matters what we do. So we pay attention to the God who judges what we do as we seek to follow him. And he is still just. He still cares about the plight of the oppressed 
and so should we. He's, he still plans to come and make this world just. As he sent his son Jesus, he will return to bring justice to the world that he has created. So in turn, we seek these things too. We seek justice as well. We seek righteousness as well. We seek goodness for, for those that, that we have covenanted with and that God has put us together with so that we might embody the characteristics of our God, so that we might live up to the call of our God that we see even in the words of Nahum to the people of Nineveh. God is at work in us. God was at work in his people of the day, and we have an opportunity to understand more about who he is and what he wants from us as we read his words through his prophets. Thanks be to God for his love, for his jealousy, for his judgment, for his justice, for the gift of his son Jesus. together. Uh, we have many needs as we, as we think about our church family, our community, our country, and this world that, that we live in. And God cares about the things that we care about, the needs that we have, the struggles we're going through. So I want to invite you today to think about who, it, who is it that, that comes to mind as I consider 
who I can lift up in prayer. Because the Holy Spirit will bring up to us those needs. And I just want to invite you to take some time and listen to the Spirit's guidance to who we can be lifting up in prayer. The things that God cares about so that we can raise those issues to him. And take some time to be in the presence of Christ as we spend it in prayer together. So whoever you're with, gather together and pray. so glad that you have joined with us today in worship and hope that you've been challenged by uh, the characteristics of a God who loves his people and uh, who brings justice in, in this world that he's created. Uh, we hope that you are, will, will uh, continue to seek out uh, who Christ is and what he's doing in your life and his desire to walk with you through everything that you go through. I want to remind you that we have our Tuesday morning Bible study each week at 10 a.m. and anyone's invited to join us for that. We distance and wear masks and keep each other safe while we are uh, beginning the, the book of Luke on, on our way towards uh, a time of celebrating his death and resurrection at Easter. Also, Thursday night, 7th grade through 12th grade are invited to join us for youth group. We'd love to have uh, kids come and, and be a part of, of Thursday nights as we play games, as we um, have some snacks, and as, as we are challenged by uh, the scriptures. And so in, in, invite your friends and come and join us Thursday night at 7 o'clock. We appreciate you guys being with us, and we hope that you have needs. If you have needs, you will get in touch with us and let us help you out, uh, be there for you. Uh, reminder that we have a parking lot pantry and if you have need for food come and take what you need if you have the ability to help us out come and bring some things to share as God continues to use that ministry to reach out to our neighbors thanks again for being here have a great week